is Jason Leahy, Executive Director of the Illinois Principals Association. So grateful for you joining us for this IPA talk and we've got something very special here for you today. We're going to hear from a couple members of the Latino Policy Forum here in the state of Illinois about an, an exciting uh, guide that we've got a handbook for English language learners to help school leaders uh, with getting very intentional about supporting English language learners in their schools. Uh, but to get us started, I want to introduce who I've got here with me today uh, on Zoom. We're not able to do this thing in person quite yet as we're still uh, kind of working through the phases of reopening here in the state of Illinois. But uh, Dr. Rebecca von der Navarro, I rolled my R R's just for you, Rebecca, uh, doing that. And then Karen Garibay Molitari. Uh, Karen, did I get that right? Yes, you did. You did. Excellent. Appreciate <laughs> that uh, here. You know, I always know when telemarketers call the Leahy household because they never say Leahy. It's never <laughs> that. So uh, both of you have those names. I'm sure you're tipped off really early if the, the calls you're getting at home are legit <laughs> or not. Uh, well, I'd like the opportunity for each of you to introduce yourself briefly. Uh, so, Rebecca, I'll just start with you if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit, just real quick, a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I'm the director of education policy and research at a, it's a state level advocacy organization called the Latino Policy Forum. And we focus on a number of issues, housing, immigration, civic engagement, um, but obviously we focus on education. And we're really concerned with Latinos and English learners having access to an equitable education um, that sees language and culture as assets to learning. Um, and we're just really pleased to be here today and collaborating with principals, but also with school board associations and IASA on, on this project. Yeah, that's great. And it's, it's been fun to be a part of that and, and see the evolution of this work. Um, and so we'll sure get to, to all of that in just a moment. But uh, Karen, I'd like to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Sure, I'm Karen garibay Molitary, and uh, I was a career educator, first grade teacher for about 15 years, uh, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent, worked at ISBE, and finally uh, ended my career as the um, chief officer for uh, language and culture in Chicago. And um, I find that um, these are just amazing complex times. I think leaders really are well-intentioned. They want to do well by their students. They want every child to succeed. And so we're hopeful that this handbook might be a great resource for them, uh, one place that they can find all kinds of valuable information. But I've walked in those shoes, and I'm so happy to be here, Jason. Well, grateful for that. Uh, so just real quick before we, we dive into the handbook and, and the work involved with putting this, this resource together, um, you know, just to give a broader perspective, and, and each of you touched on a little bit of the things that you've got going on, uh, but just to give a little broader perspective of the work of the Latino Policy Forum, uh, be interesting to just hear of what you've been doing during the, the pandemic. And, and now even as we look at the, the broader societal things that are happening right now, uh, with, with the protests, with Black Lives Matter, and, and, and just also being, you know, more intentional. I, I think this is really, really timely here for us. I know we're, we're focused more with, with our English learners and, and Latino students, but all that being said is just being more sensitive to the needs of all of our kids here. I'm, I'm just curious, in particular, you know, what, what type of work has the Latino Policy Forum been doing right now, just dealing with the historic moment that we're, we're currently in? And I'll, I'll just toss that out for either one of you to jump in in there. Yeah, our executive director has really forged incredible leadership in trying to make sure that organizations that serve Latinos are, are getting the philanthropic dollars that are being handed out right now. A lot of times, newer, smaller organizations that are really connected in communities don't always have the infrastructure and aren't always seen by those in power or recognized yet. And so she's done really great advocacy to make sure that those communities, especially communities outside Chicago, where they might be newer, um, are receiving resources. There's been phenomenal need, as folks know out there, just for food. 
Um, uh, folks might know too, now not all the Latino community is immigrant, but many are, and some are undocumented, and they don't get access to any of the federal stimulus money that's gone out. So many are in tremendous crisis um, in certain areas of our state. Um, the forum has also taken a lead on uh, providing data on uh, positivity rates and um, that kind of healthcare data and been presenting that to congressional delegation down in Springfield, really trying to sensitize how uh, diverse and varied COVID is throughout our state and how it's playing out differently in different areas. And then specifically with the education team, I, I can start it, and Karen, you can, I, obviously we're working together on this project, but we're looking nationally to see what states are doing to respond to English learners and um, accelerating learning and also responding to the digital divide. Um, and we're, um, we've talked to uh, a number of districts cumulatively, they oversee about 100,000 ELs in our state. And I, I can't say enough how, um, proud I am of the practitioners in Illinois that really have stepped up to what are unprecedented times and responding to immediate needs, but also getting creative in reaching out to students and to families to make sure that they're connected and involved. And we're hoping to create recommendations um, based on what we're seeing nationally, what we're hearing, and, and what, the, what the literature is telling us. Yeah, something for practitioners to know is that uh, many Latino and EL students uh, are, are in pockets and communities where COVID may be more prevalent. They may have less access to health care. There's also food scarcity, scarcity issues and internet, as Rebecca mentioned, internet and digital divide. And, all, and I know we have to be prepared in the fall when we return that some of these children um, may have lost a dear loved one, you know, due to this virus. So there are the, the SEL issues that we'll be facing. But so we are about coming up with specific recommendations uh, around COVID for this population that would also serve um, educators that are dealing with the children in the classroom. So Karen, just kind of asking you to put your principal's hat back on since that's the primary audience for us, obviously. You know, when you think about serving the Latino students in this moment in time and thinking about, you know, getting back to school here in the fall, I know Chicago is actually still in school, but a lot of districts are, are done and wrapped up. Hopefully, principals are taking a bit of a break and a breather, as we were discussing earlier. But obviously, it's top of mind of, you know, what, what is the fall going to bring? You know, when you think about that, what is the thing that, that is right at the top of your list when you think about meeting the needs of Latino students in, in the fall uh, as we're still working through the pandemic? Yeah, I think two things come to mind. First of all, if I were back in, in the building, I would want to know each and every child that lost someone. Um, I want to have my uh, social service team ready for these kids. I'd want to have a plan with the classroom teacher of how we can support them in the grieving process. But also on top of that, you have to be super sensitive that many of these children are in the families of essential workers. And so when we talk about things like staggered schedules, if the older kids are not home before the younger kids, this could be a problem for families. Um, we were hearing stories of fifth graders actually trying to help their younger siblings get online for remote learning, you know, because the parents were called to work. So it's not unique to the Latino community, but it's very prevalent. So I would be thinking of those things. Absolutely. And, you know, also we've had, uh, as you guys know, most ELs are concentrated in the early grades. So preschool, K, first, second. And I was talking with someone yesterday out in Elgin that was talking about just the fear so many little ones have about going back to buildings, people with masks on. Um, and they were making recommendations about make sure in the play area that the dolls actually have little masks and they can they can practice with them on. And I thought that that's brilliant, right? Uh, so that kids can kind of work through this and process it. I talked to another school leader that was talking about bringing small groups initially back into the school so they could kind of feel their way out because this is just, it's scary. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, those are all terrific suggestions here, especially as you think about our young students. And, and I, I, I've got one of my five at home in particular. He is he's very uh, sensitive, you know, when it comes to just his own uh, perception and, and what's going on around him and, and uh, you know, the kinds of things that you recommend there, Rebecca, I think could be really important to helping him kind of yeah. work through because the thought of people being in masks, the, product, the fact that they could put shields up around him, I mean, I, just, I think films of 
maybe being claustrophobic or whatever initially here until there's some level of comfort could be could be a real challenge. Obviously, many things for us to be considering and working through, but I, I want to get on to you know the purpose for us uh, having this conversation, uh, which is this outstanding resource, uh, very thorough. I mean, it's you guys have worked to cover a, a lot of ground, and it's, it's been fun to, to see this thing uh, take shape because I think it will be very valuable to all school leaders across the state when it comes to serving their Latino students, their English learners uh, in their school communities. And so just for, for reference points, so people know what the title of this is, it's the English, the LOA English Learner Handbook, a Guide for School Board Members, District Administrators, and Principals. And so maybe the obvious question here off the start when introducing something like this is just, you know, why, why spend the, the time and effort that you did in putting this together? I mean, what and that may seem like an obvious question to, to ask or, or the answer to that might seem obvious, but I think it's important, you know, as we always look to kind of start with our why with things. So, you know, what was the reason for tackling this? Yeah, I can kind of give some history to the policy and then, and then Karen can give a great like kind of personal testimony as to why she would have liked something like this when she, when she was new to the field. For uh, a number of years, and Jason, you were at these tables, we worked on two huge changes in Illinois education. One was changes to school accountability from No Child Left Behind to the Every Student Succeeds Act. And another one was new state school funding with the new evidence-based formula. And these were huge policy changes. We took a big lead in how ELs were considered in accountability and in trying to bring in more bilingual money. But we noticed, and this often happens in education, these big changes happen and folks are just expected to implement them on the ground. And there's not this uh, really uh, specific support for practitioners on what these changes mean and what's the best way to implement them. So it really was about policy implementation as the beginning of it. And then the more we got into it, it grew into such a comprehensive document, like you said, where it, it's not necessarily something you would sit and read cover to cover. It's more something that a practitioner could pick up and say, I want to know best practice around assessments. Or, you know what, I'm starting this new ESL program in my school. How do I fund it? How do I marry local, state, title money to make this happen? Or what's a great way to create a vision for my school board? Um, you know, Karen herself has done amazing work in starting dual language and getting this sold to your school board is part of that process. So um, it's turned into this real labor of love, uh, but we are noticing that there, this was just missing from the field. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as I've, as I've worked through the document, what I found is that I really appreciate is, is you give some real examples of school districts that have done some of this work, which I, I think is very interesting. So let's just dig in a little bit. And Karen, I'll turn to you if, if you would mind just sharing, you know, what I, Rebecca alluded to some of these things, but, you know, what type of, of ground or, or specific items are you trying to cover key topics that you're trying to cover in the handbook uh, for, for people? From the practitioner's point of view, um, you know, back when I was in the central office with many districts, it would have been wonderful to have one one play, one size fits all document that outlined like the legal requirements. You know, there are federal and state statutes around English learners. And there's also some really good research that can guide your decisions about your programs. And oftentimes the resource can, can serve you, you know, as you're forming uh, teacher leader teams or also, if you have to go to the school board with a proposal, you can back it up with some research, you know, um, as you're making your presentation to the board. So, you know, back when I was starting, none of this was compiled. And I also thought, Rebecca and I both agreed, we really wanted to honor the work of some cutting edge districts who have really produced some fantastic outcomes. And we think that they can be a resource for many. Um, so it was really fun to capture their stories. It was great. Absolutely. So when you think about those districts that you've highlighted, um, you know, just for the benefit of those listening or watching, you know, what, what are just some examples of key things? Maybe not the whole, the whole picture, right? But what are just some key brushstrokes that, that, they, that they carried forward and, and made happen in their schools or districts to really make sure they had good outcomes for Latino students? 
Well, the big, I, I noticed straight away that typically there was a, there was a leader with a strong conviction and a strong understanding of research that really felt, like Rebecca mentioned earlier, that language and culture can be assets to learning. And sometimes all it takes is one key person to make a big change in a district. And it happens over time. And I also noticed that these leaders were strong. They were armed with, with information. They also tended to stay with their districts. Yeah. Um, they began something, they nurtured it, and they stayed with it. And now there are some phenomenal uh, outcomes. And they were tended to be the kind of people that are so dedicated to equity. Like I want to see my English learner who's coming from an impoverished household take an AP class. You know, I want to see this child graduate from high school in four years. So they tended to have a long-term view of what, what, what they saw as equity. And I think they're, that's fantastic. It takes that. Um, I think it also takes a willing school board. I really want to start with school board members because um, I couldn't have done what I, was what I was able to do in Chicago and what I was able to do in West Chicago and even in Elmhurst had it not been for some school board members who actually asked me about books and actually read up on the EL population so that they could make informed decisions. So school board members, you know, are going to make critical decisions about budget, budget cuts. They're going to make decisions about hiring. And if you can have their support, it's just phenomenal. Well, and when you think about the, the tough fiscal issues that we dealt with over the last decade and, and maybe what we might be walking into here as we, we work through the effects of the pandemic on the economy and such, you know, having those people engaged obviously are really important as we work to prioritize things for schools. But I, I want to key on one thing that you mentioned there that really lines up with our thinking here as far as IPA is current concern uh, that we, we really started to, to bang the drum on, and that is the tenure of leadership within either the school or the district and, and hopefully in both positions. Um, what, what we found is, is that right now the national statistics are showing that, that principals in particular are only, if you were, well, let me just say this, if you were to hire four principals today into new positions, whether they were brand new uh, principals or, or veterans in new positions, in five years, only one of those people statistically on average will still be in that same position. And we also know from the research that it takes five to 10 years, depending on the size of the school, to get any real you know, significant change to take place. And those two things are not adding up, obviously. And so it's, it's interesting to me that you found through your work here and, and what you're you know, advising is that we make sure that we get high quality leaders. And we, it is important, right? Leadership is critical, but that we are able to keep those, per, those people in those positions for an extended period of time so that we can get sustained change to happen. So thank you for reinforcing what we've been talking about here for, for quite a while. I, I sure appreciate that. Um, so when you think about, you know, pushing this forward, what, what do we need to do to be supporting schools at this point in time, either from a policy perspective or, you know, what needs to be happening when, within districts? When you think about the recommendations that you're putting forward uh, in this handbook, um, you know, what, what types of helps or supports are schools going to need to be able to make this thing happen? I'll let uh, Rebecca, we'll turn to you first. Please. Sure. I mean, I think there's a number of things. I mean, each, like you said, each section has recommendations, local activities, and a school highlight. I think one thing uh, that's important um, that uh, really was highlighted recently in a collaboration we have with the University of Chicago, they looked at English learners in Chicago public schools in a huge cohort, over 18,000 kids, and I think this could apply to ELs throughout our state, is they didn't just follow them once they reached English proficiency and left services, but they took a longitudinal view to see how these kids were doing over time. And I think that is so important because often the success that these kids are having, and they found out that the kids were doing really well once they left services, they looked at grades, they looked at tests, they looked at attendance. And I think too often bilingual programs are given a bad rap, a bad name, because we're only looking at kids who are current ELs on their way to learning English and how they're doing on exams. And then once they reach proficiency and have mastered it and could do well on exams, they're already out the door. Yeah. And so this, this idea of looking at former English learners 
and tracking some of the things that Karen talked about, let's get beyond test scores. Let's look at how many are graduating on time. How many are taking AP, IB, dual credit courses? How many are getting the state seal of biliteracy, which is a rigorous recognition at graduation that you speak a language other than English. And this could really give us a much different view of these kids over the long term. And also, like we said, help praise the practitioners who were serving these kids and serving them well, but were only not getting any credit for how they did over time. And so I think um, a really big thing, it's, it's not necessarily a sexy, exciting thing to say, let's talk about data, but this could really be important for reconceptualizing these kids and, and for, for building up the field that bilingual has really, can really struggle with turnover. Um, and I think uh, a lot of them feel demoralized and like their work isn't being recognized. I think this long-term view could really help us in, in changing that. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely. not a panacea, but it's, a, it's, a part, it's an important piece of this. Mm -hmm. Well, what I, what I like about what we've got here with the handbook is for, for districts, for leaders that are looking to be intentional, this really does provide some concrete recommendations and suggestions and also provide some examples for schools and districts that are actually getting the job done, uh, which I, I think is really helpful, obviously, from a credibility perspective. But it's sure nice to have a little bit of, of thought and context. And, and maybe this is a way that I ought to consider going. So, you know, if I'm a school leader really working to serve my students in this way. So when you guys think about long term, you know, five, 10 years down the road, um, you know, and, and obviously, it, a resource like this is just a first step. There has to be training and supports. And when you talk about evidence-based funding and, and making sure that we've got the resources, fiscal and otherwise, for school districts to have. So that there's much of that work to be done. But, you know, what are, what are your hopes for, for this resource and, and maybe some other work that, that needs to occur uh, for us down the road when you think maybe five or, or 10 years down the road? And I'd like to hear from you, from both of you. So, Karen, I'll start with you and then you know, sure. what I have to say. I would say over, over my career, I realized that to have success, it was a, it, there were three critical things. And I learned this through experience and through trial and error. You have to have a vision for these students. And the vision should be based on research. And your policy, your local school board policy has to match that vision. And then you have to put the funding to it. Uh, adequate amounts of funding. With those three things, you will make you will get a, f a long way. So my my hope is that this res and also then um, the handbook uh, tries to give evidence. Well, it does give evidence of research based practices that are proven investments. If I do this, there are outcomes attached to this. So I think what we really want to do is we really hope that we can help. Um, school leaders make wise choices about their investments and about how they structure structure their schools and their programs for the best outcomes. Yeah. That's correct. Rebecca, how about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think English learners are one of the fastest growing groups of students, and yet um, many leaders have not received preparation or support on how to serve them. And I, um, I've, I've seen some research saying that that can cause burnout for leadership when they didn't expect to have this population, they're now responsible for it. I think I hear some, some folks feeling kind of intimidated um, about it. And I'm hoping with this handbook, folks can see um, that this is a population they can serve and it's, it's, uh, it's inviting to serve them. And I think one thing that would be really exciting just to open people's mind to First, in the U.S., we've been monolingual for so long. Talking about dual language is radical. But you go to most countries, and it's pretty routine to expect to speak more than one language. And in a global society, this is becoming more and more the norm. And a wonderful, beautiful example most folks don't even know about is Woodstock, Illinois. This is not a burgeoning metropolitan area. This was a school that um, has a, a pretty strong Latino population, low income, also has native English speakers. And instead of, oh, no, we have all these ELs coming, what are we going to do? They use that as an opportunity to build dual language. It took time, as Karen said, dedication. It didn't happen overnight, but they've built it into the high school. They have a 96% graduation rate of their Latinos. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than they're all. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is doable. This is doable. It, it took tremendous time. It took drawing from the community to bring in teachers. Um, it, it, they're constantly thinking about, about um, how they cultivate more bilingual teachers. But they're finally now starting to get to the point that these kids who are getting the state seal of biliteracy at graduation want to go back 
and teach. And if we could help flip the paradigm in any way in Illinois, um, that uh, these kids can enrich your school, can enrich your environment, enrich practice for everyone in a way everyone benefits, that would be a huge win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and as, as you were speaking there, Rebecca, that, that last comment you made is the thing that really comes to mind for me, because I, I would be hopeful for myself as I think about this down the road that all school leaders would take an interest in this, this sort of guy. Uh, because I think, you know, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, that if, if you don't have a Latino student or a population of Latino students in your schools now, that, that will happen at some point in time. Um, so I think you, you have to, to deal with that inevitability to make sure you're prepared to, to take care of those students in your school. Uh, but the other part is, is, the, is reference to the last thing that you shared there, is that I feel like the, the types of, uh, interventions and work that you're talking about here would be helpful for all kids, right? I mean, we're just talking about good educational practice here, obviously, and, and there might be some unique needs of the Latino population, but but this is good stuff for all of our students uh, to really be considering. So I'm grateful for that that part of it as well, and and how you're calling out just good leadership practice and and everything across the board. So. Uh, I'm hopeful for us to continue to be engaging with both of you and the Latino Policy Forum uh, with regards to to the handbook and and all of that. Um, and just for reference point again, this is the Illinois English Learner Handbook, a guide for school board members, district administrators, and principals. Uh, as I was sharing with both of you earlier, we will put a link to your site in the description uh, for the video, as well as just information that will be. Uh, sharing out about this, but you know, any other any other kinds of things that you're planning with this down the road that might be helpful for people to hear right now. We're seeing it right now as a foundational document that right now, because of COVID, trying to get it out there virtually as quick as possible, and it's free, which I think yeah. is an important thing to let everybody know. Price is right. <laughs> yeah, the price is right. So, um, but uh, we're hoping over time to have it where you could download chapters because we really could see each chapter turning into its own um, its own discussion point for practitioners, yeah. depending on where they're at in, in their practice. Yeah, but it's still absolutely. kind of evolving. Right. And we're having some discussions with regional offices of, of, of education as to what kind of trainings might be beneficial down the road. But we wanted to get this handbook out now while uh, summer is here. Some people might pick it up, take a look at it and uh, give them some ideas for even the fall, you know, some things that they might want to think about. So, um, yeah, we're very, we're very excited and, and grateful to the Illinois Principals Association for partnering with us, really, and, and helping this project along. Well, it's sure been our pleasure for that, and grateful to both of you for joining me here for this IPA talk. So with me, Karen Garibay, Molotari, did mm -hmm. I get Yep. Sorry, Karen. I'm just <laughs> double checking there uh, for that. And then Dr. Rebecca Vanderlack Navarro uh, with me as well, both of you with the Latino Policy Forum. Thanks for jumping on to Zoom. Wish we could do this face to face in person. Uh, maybe the next time we'll be able to do that. So both of you stay safe and be well and, and uh, we'll look forward to catching up real soon. Sounds okay. great. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Again, my name is Jason Leahy, Executive Director of the Illinois Principals Association. Thanks for joining me for this IPA talk. As I mentioned, uh, a link to this guide will be in the description of this video. And as always, if there's anything the IPA can do for you, don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, or you can check us out on the web at ilprinciples.org. Take care. <laughs>